Hello, everyone. I think we are just about ready to get started. I hope everyone can hear me properly. If you are able to hear me, please type yes in the chat box, which should be to the left side of your screen. Great. I see a bunch of yeses, um, so it looks like everyone can hear clearly. Uh, welcome to Asthma Canada's second speaker series webinar. Our 2018 webinar series has been made possible through unrestricted reg educational grants from GSK and Novartis. The topic today is asthma in children, management and support. Thank you for joining us. My name is Manaz Rahman and I'm the manager of programs and services at Asthma Canada. I will be your moderator today. Please note that the webinar will be recorded and made available later on our website and YouTube channel. All attendees are muted, but if you have any questions, please type them into the chat box, which we, we'll, we will be monitoring throughout the session. There will be a question and answer period after the presentation has ended, and our speaker will try to get to all the questions at that time. And very quickly, before we begin, I would like to highlight some of the work we do here at Asthma Canada. We're the only national organization solely dedicated to helping all Canadians affected by asthma. We're committed to improving the lives of the Canadian asthma community through education and support services, research and advocacy. We provide education and support to those living with asthma and their families and communities, both in print and online. We offer free services like our asthma and allergy helpline, which gives all Canadians access to certified respiratory educators. And just as an FYI, if you have any questions about preparing as your children head back to school, please feel free to reach out to our helpline. We run an Asthma Pals mentorship program for kids with asthma to help children deal with the psychosocial issues of living with asthma. And you can sign up on our website to receive details about our next Asthma Pals session. We advocate to the Canadian government on improving health outcomes for people with asthma. Our current priorities include clean air, clean energy, and equitable access to medications and treatment options across the country. You can learn more on our website and join us by participating in our active letter writing campaign to government representatives. We support research for improved treatment options and to find a cure for asthma. Last year, we initiated a new addition to our national research program to provide grants to emerging asthma researchers in partnership with Allergen and CEE. And in fact, we will be announcing the winners of the 2018 awards shortly. Additionally, much of the work we do is with our volunteers and members across the country, people living with asthma, their families, parents, caregivers, communities, healthcare providers, educators, and others who are committed to improving asthma care. The Asthma Canada Member Alliance, ACMA, is a free membership of Canadians who engage in the work we do and help provide input and their voice in our initiatives. If you aren't yet a member, we encourage you to join us by visiting www.asthma.ca slash join. Please visit our website for more information and feel free to get in touch with me at any time. And uh, now I would like to introduce our distinguished speaker for today, Stu Susan Balkovic. Susan Balkovic is a registered respiratory therapist and certified asthma educator in the respiratory med medicine division at Sick Kids Hospital in Toronto. In her role, she provides asthma education to families of children who've been hospitalized or been to the in intensive care unit for asthma. She collaborates with multidisciplinary team with the multidisciplinary team regarding asthma management and with the families during scheduled visits in the ambulatory asthma clinic. As an educator, Susan has been very active within Sick Kids, promoting standardization of asthma education and management with the other staff members to improve programs. She has taught both students and teachers about proper asthma management at a number of schools in the greater Toronto area. Susan was also involved in the early stages of the Canadian Healthy Infant Longitudinal Development Child Study, a prospective longitudinal birth cohort study still in progress, which looks at early determinants of asthma and allergy. As the lead respiratory therapist, she directed the infant pulmonary function team looking at the role of lung function variables early in life. And so with that, um, let's begin. And uh, you can take over whenever you're ready, Susan. Okay, thank you very much, Manaz. And I just wanted to thank uh, Asthma Canada as well for this invitation to host this webinar. It's quite an honor. And also, I wanted to thank all the webinar members for um, joining us today and taking time out of your busy schedules. I know life is busy, and I hope that I can be of service and that you'll be able to um, take some information today that might be useful for any um, children that you take care of that have asthma. So I just wanted to start off with a little bit of an outline of what I'm going to be speaking about today. 
I just want to um, start off with what are the primary goals of asthma and, um, and its asthma management. The majority of the time I'm going to focus on the multifaceted approach um, to asthma management that we do as uh, healthcare team members along with um, definite input um, with uh, family members and caregivers, which is very important to have a good uh, back and forth uh, communication and also a good relationship. And also, what are some of the supports that children with asthma need in daily life and also um, supports in school? But please know that this is also very applicable to daycares and other um, caregivers that are taking care of children uh, with asthma. Okay, so I'm just going to start off with what are our primary goals um, of asthma? And so your child has been diagnosed with asthma, and so now what? What are we going to do? So the number one thing is that we want to achieve control. And I don't want to start off with a negative note and say that there is no, that there is no cure, but please know that it can be treated and children can be controlled to live a very normal life. Please understand that asthma is not static. It's very dynamic. It changes and it improves and worsens depending on a whole bunch of varying factors. And so one of the two most important aspects to achieving control is ensuring that we have the proper medications on board and also that we're controlling the environment um, because we know that the environment is a huge factor in what triggers uh, people with asthma. And so we look at it really as like a continuum of management and a bit of a sliding scale. So once we, if for example, if we can get the environment under good control, then we can adjust the therapy accordingly. Um, and for example, um, we know that definitely viruses and the viral season always tends to be a very difficult time for children with asthma. And it's one of the, one of the number one triggers. And so some of the things that we do is that we can either step up or start therapy before the viral season, and we can adjust it as according to um, exacerbations that occur during the time. And then once the viral season is over, then we can look at making adjustments, either um, you know reducing therapy and even sometimes coming off medications altogether. So it is a continuum. And then lastly, we really want to ensure that we're preventing any future risk from occurring. But fortunately, please understand that asthma can be effectively treated. Most children can be under good control. And, in, and what good control means, I'm going to be talking a lot about this throughout um, my talk today, is that it really means avoiding symptoms day and night, needing little or no reliever medication, having very productive lives, having normal to near normal lung function, and avoiding serious attacks. Okay, so what are, what are the cornerstones of asthma management? Um, the first couple of things is that we need the appropriate medications. Daily controller therapy is very important. We use the reliever only on an as needed um, basis. And this sometimes requires some tweaking in order to get um, good control. So another reason why it's very important to always get reassessments, especially if there's been any exacerbations. Um, the other very important piece to this is ensuring that there's a, um, asthma education and that we can provide um, families with good self-management strategies. And what does that include? That includes appropriate inhaler technique, ensuring that there's adherence to medications, which means how compliant are we with medications. And please, please, please be honest with your healthcare team with respect to this, because we don't want to over medicate your children. So if you're forgetting um, to give the medication, then you need to know, you need to sort of communicate that with your healthcare team. Um, also, um, there's uh, environmental trigger avoidance. First of all, we have to identify what the environmental triggers are and then coming up with control strategies and getting a written action plan. This is very, this is very important um, as well. And then regular assessment of asthma control, which may include lung function um, when a child is able to do uh, breathing tests and that they're able to follow instruction. So I'm going to be talking 
um, about each of these in a little bit more detail. Okay, so in terms of, so I'm going to start off with respect to uh, medications and um, how we manage asthma in this, um, in this manner. And so the best way that I can explain this is through um, just through through uh, explaining what a, re a reliever or a rescue medication versus what a controller is doing. And I'm going to be flip-flopping between the next two slides because I feel um, which uh, the symptoms of asthma all comes into um, tie with this. So if we take a look at the normal airway on the left-hand side here as you're looking at the screen, please understand that this is also someone with asthma who is under good control. The only difference is that they need the appropriate medications and good environmental control. See, you can see that the airway is nice and patent. You can breathe easily through that. And you can see that there's these muscles that are wrapped around um, the airway as well. And in an asthma exacerbation, which you can see on the right side, that one of the first things that happens is these muscles that are wrapped around the airway, they clamp down, they become twitchy, then they have um, what we like to, what we call is a bronchospasm. And if you have continued exposure to a trigger, sorry, that's all in response to a trigger that has been identified, you get this mucus and the swelling into um, the airway, and it becomes very difficult to breathe. And so um, when that cascade is occurring, there are different symptoms and signs of asthma that occur. And what we, what we know that in most commonly in children, one of the first signs is a cough. And also the other thing that I want to make, uh, that I want make people to understand is that a cough alone could also be asthma in the absence of any other symptoms. A cough is very difficult because it can be difficult to differentiate as well, but a cough alone could, um, could, could also be a sign or symptom of asthma. Um, but for the most part, it can be a, um, a, um, any one of these things on, um, on the list here. Um, in children, um, some of the most common signs of respiratory distress um, are that the nose could start to flare, and this could be ever, ever so slightly. They could be, um, they could start tugging in um, at the neck, which we call tracheal tug. They could be breathing very heavily, breathing faster. Um, you could see the belly sort of working hard, and the skin between the ribs can start um, to suck in. And some of the early signs, this can be very, very, very so slight. But otherwise, the symptoms can vary in, in occurrence, intensity, and frequency. So now when we go back, I'm just going to go back here, and I'm just going to explain how do the medications work. So one of the first things that we do and try in the continuum is is the reliever or the rescue puffer. So this is usually, uh, usually I'm saying, is a blue puffer. And this works specifically on the muscles that are wrapped around the airway. So that twitchiness and that clamping down. And how do we know that this is working? So this is a big key as well. So it should work within five to 10 minutes. Its peak effect is at two hours, but after four hours, it doesn't work anymore. And this is a really, really important, especially with your action plans later, which I'm going to talk to talk about. So that timing is 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 very important as well. Now, what it does absolutely nothing for is it does nothing for the mucus and the swelling. So if we're constantly giving just blue puffer, blue puffer, blue puffer, or reliever, rescue, whatever you want to call it, um, we're not getting to the root of the problem. And that can actually become very dangerous. And it's really just a Band-Aid effect because you can build a you can build, it's like a tolerance um, to the blue puffer and it can actually stop working. So this is where the controller medicine is super important. You need to use it regularly because unlike the blue one, it takes a probably we say like a really good two weeks to get the optimum best, best effects from it. So it's better to use a low dose inhaled controller medicine every single day than to wait till it gets too bad where, where we need oral steroids and you get much more side effects from that. And you do not want to stop that 
when you start to feel better because we know that it's actually working. And especially with children who are getting viruses during the viral season. Um, I know with my daughter, it was when, when, when she was younger, um, I know there was maybe one week out of the whole winter when she was a preschooler that she was even well. So um, that's why it's very important to give it um, to uh, give that medicine continuously. And also the this inflammation and swelling, it takes a bit of time to accumulate and then it can also take a very long time to go away. And that's why it's also important to use that on an everyday basis. And so if we're using the blue puffer more than four times, sorry, more than three times in a week, then that's when we add the controller medicine. Um, and we use the controller medicine on a daily basis, whether we're well, whether we're, whether we're well or whether we're sick. Or, um, and then you use the, the reliever rescue puffer on an as needed basis. And so just um, one thing I wanted to mention um, with respect to the signs and symptoms of asthma, in children, it can be very difficult to express what is happening to their bodies. They can say um, that their tummy is hurting, but maybe it actually means that their chest is, um, that they're having an asthma uh, exacerbation. And so we have tools that we can do to help younger children to get more in touch with their bodies to understand what is happening. There's a very good little storybook called Call Me Brave Boy. I know the Ontario Lung Association has that um, available and it's a storybook so it's appropriate for children and it talks about the elephant on the chest and that's what it feels like when your asthma is acting up. And so we recommend things like that for children to be able to also express um, their symptoms. So onward we're with some of continuing asthma management and some um, education and self-management. One very, very important aspect is to ensure the proper delivery device um, is the proper delivery is a proper delivery device with the um, medication that you that you have received. Sorry, just taking a drink of water. Um, many children will be prescribed their asthma medications in the form of a puffer or something we call an MDI, which is a meter dose inhaler. Now, I highly, 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 highly recommend using a chamber or a spacer regardless of whether you're two years old or whether you're 50 years old, if you're using a puffer in this form that you're seeing in the picture here. It is really our gold standard. And when I do my teaching with my families, I really like to tell them exactly why, like why are you doing what you're doing? Um, so why do we recommend a chamber or a spacer? For coordination, um, it allows for better lung deposition because please, we all know that asthma is happening deeper in the airways to allow for better control of symptoms. When you spray it directly in the mouth, and you'll see many, many people doing this, most of it goes to the back of the throat. You will swallow this. You can get more side effects this way. You end up wasting the drug. Money gets wasted. And you may feel that you need to take more than what you actually need. And so in terms of also, I'm just going to talk very briefly about um, the technique and some of the most common things that I that I see in our clinic here um, that I would like to um, sort of ensure that people are, are, are doing out there. With this, what you see here, this is a mask chamber. This is for younger children um, to use with a puffer. Um, what I have seen commonly is families come to us and they say, we, we, we puff it into the chamber and then we count to 10. That is, that, is, that is fine. However, we know that studies have shown us that it takes at least five breaths to empty the chamber. Children can get very distracted. They can hold their breath. And so then how do we know that if we're counting to 10, whether they're actually emptying the chamber of the medication? So what we recommend is that you actually are counting the number of breaths. So you want to count at least five to 10 breaths, we say, if they're having a bad day, bad day five breaths is good enough, ideally up to 10. 
And also the person administering should be doing the counting and not the child. If the child is counting, what this happens is that it produces turbulent flow and it doesn't allow for the medication to get really deep in the airways. And if the child is able to follow instruction, get them to take as deep as breaths as possible um, so that they can get the most of the medication. Um, I'm not going over all the details of the step-by-step, there's some really great literature out there and some fact sheets by the Ontario Lung Association, and they also have some great videos. Going onward, when a child gets a little bit older and they're still being prescribed a puffer, it is really best to transition to a mouthpiece um, chamber as much um, uh, whenever possible. So what we do in order to do in order to decide whether this is appropriate, we usually look at the ability to do a breathing test because they have to be able to follow instruction. You have to be able to also make a proper seal around the mouthpiece. Um, and to be able to breathe through the mouth and not through the nose. A lot of children, they're obligate nose breathers. And so it's very important that they're breathing through the mouth so that they're actually getting the, me getting the medication. And with this um, type of device, it is really recommended that we use a, a technique um, in which we do a single breath hold. Um, I'm just gonna explain really quickly what we do is we say you breathe all the air out um, off to the side first. You puff, you, take, you make a nice seal, you make a really, take a very, very deep breath in, as deep as you can, and you wanna hold it for about 10 seconds. And again, why are we doing that? What we do is when we're holding our breath, we're stenting our airways open, and it's allowing the medication to get deep, deep, deep into the airways where the asthma is really occurring. During transitions, what we can do as well is we can have the ch child on the mouthpiece, but they can just be breathing some normal breath. That is completely fine, but studies have shown that you can get actually 50% more deposition if you can if you can do the single breath hold. So we're always trying to really strive for that. And the last thing I wanna say is that it's really, really important to keep track of when the puffer is empty. A lot of times um, people are using empty puffers without really, without really um, knowing. And again, I'm not gonna go into all the little details about this, but again, I know from, from my perspective, I know the Ontario Lung Association has a really good step-by-step -step fact sheet and some videos um, with respect to this as well. Older children, may be prescribed um, something that comes in the form of a dry powder inhaler if they're able to use it properly. This is not for preschoolers. And the main difference from this using this um, and an MDI is that the only, only difference is that with a dry powder, you need to be able to do a very quick inhalation. Whereas the MDI with the spacer, you use a very slow inhalation. And please also understand that certain medications only come in certain device forms, okay? And again, it's very important when, when you get reassessed that you, that you know and that you are um, very honest with your health, um, uh, healthcare team members with respect to how, of, how often are you actually um, administering the medication. If you're, you know what, we understand you know, life is busy, you're gonna miss one or two doses, no big deal. But if you're missing two to three doses a week, um, then that, or sorry, two to three days a week, then, you know, this is, this is um, you know, we take that into effect when we're doing our, re our reassessments. Okay. So in continuation of education and self-management, it's really very, very important to identify all the different um, triggers that can affect asthma and also to be aware of what possibly could be um, a trigger. Um, people don't realize all the different things that can um, trigger an asthma exacerbation. So I like to tell families, you're going to be a little bit like a private investigator from now on where you need to identify 
Um, and it's important to work with your health team members at your follow-up point, appointments to mention and say, hey, you know what, when my child was outside in the cold, dry air, you know, I noticed she started coughing. We gave her her rescue puffer and she did so much better. So this is really important information for your healthcare team members. So of note, I also want to explain is that um, also allergy is a huge component um, uh, we say there's about 80 to 85 percent of people that have asthma also have allergies. And so I like to say that allergy and asthma, they're like married to each other and they will affect each other. So anything that someone might be allergic to, it can affect their asthma. And what are some of the common um, aeroallergens out there? Um, there's many different animals, animals such as cats, dogs horses, um, you know, other things like feathered animals, and even cockroaches can be a problem. You know, other things like dust mites, dust mite, even in the, even in the uh, younger children, this can be an issue. And, and, you know, by identifying all these different, different allergens, what you can do is you can work with an asthma educator for different control strategies so that you can achieve environmental control. And remember before when I was saying with the two pillars that we look at is if we can gain good environmental control, then we can readjust the medications. And so, um, you know, for example, if we know that dust mite is um, one of the things that a child is allergic to, one of the most um, effective, effective things that we can do is we can get dust mite covers for the beds because children spend a lot of time in their beds and the dust mites like to live in our beds. Other things are, um, for example, molds. Molds can be an issue, indoor and outdoor molds, especially now coming into the fall season, the outdoor molds become an issue. Pollens, such as I know in Ontario, the ragweed is already high. Um, and pollens can come at various times of the year. And um, because allergens um, are, are things that can affect asthma, then an allergy skin test might be helpful. And this is something that your, your healthcare provider may decide to do. Okay, so how does an action fit, uh, sorry, sorry, how does an action plan fit into all of this? So I think in order to understand an action plan, it's really important to understand what does good control actually mean? And so, you know, when I talk to families about what good control means, they're just absolutely shocked because they didn't realize that, oh, wow, you know, we, we were out of control for a long time before we ended up in the hospital. So I'm just going to talk a little bit about this right now. And this should be assessed at every visit. There are also standardized questionnaires and scoring systems that can help with this. And so I'm just going to go through through these just a little bit. Um, daytime symptoms. Children should not have more than um, more uh, any more daytime symptoms more than three days in a week. Nighttime symptoms. This is a really interesting one. They shouldn't have any nighttime symptoms. And again, I'm going to tell you why. Remember when we had talked about how allergens are something that really can affect 85% of people um, with asthma and they can have allergy? Well, you know, we're exposed to our allergens throughout the day. And when we're sleeping, our, we are in a reparative process. And um, in the really early morning hours, like say from around two o'clock onwards, our natural anti-inflammatory steroid levels, which is exactly the same as what's in the controller, these are low at that time. And so what happens is the allergens can get expressed and then um, children can wake up um, with symptoms. And so that's why we say no nighttime symptoms. Other, thing, other things that we look at is that we want them to have normal physical activity. This is really important. We know that in childhood asthma, exercise symptoms are some of the first symptoms to appear when a child gets out of control. And it's also some of the first ones to disappear when a child is under really good control. Um, and so... Um, and so with that, it, it's really also very important that physical activity is very important and children need exercise in order to be healthy. And so we just need to get the um, 
asthma under good control so that children can have normal physical activity. Exacerbations definitely need to be mild and infrequent. We don't want any absence from school or if they have part-time work. And then again, the need for, here it says a fast acting beta agonist. Well, that's just a fancy word for the rescue or the reliever. And it's the same as the symptom, symptoms, no more than three times in a week. Um, and then also with respect to um, there's some, the, the you see there that says FEV1 or PEF, that's for peak expiratory flow rate, or these are also, this is in relation to lung function testing, and this is what we look at as healthcare professionals. And what we do is we, we can do that, and we want to make sure that we are um, greater than or equal to 90% of a person's personal best. And also, a person's personal best, it can be 80% or it could be 120%. That's why it has to be of their personal best. Um, and so we look for things like that as well. And um, if somebody's doing peak flow meter, peak um, flow um, monitoring at home, we use this for uh, children that have um, that are old enough that they're that they're able to do this regularly. And also, um, what we do is is they have a peak flow meter at home. This can be recorded in an asthma diary where they um, blow uh, first thing in the morning and they blow at nighttime. And we don't want to see a variation in that more than 10 to 15 percent um, because that can tell us that the, that, that the asthma can be um, uh, getting out of control. Um, and then the last thing is sputum eosinophils. These are more for the moderate to severe. Um, uh, children, or sorry, it's more older children, the, the older teenagers and adults with asthma. We sort of take, a, that's something that we take a look at. I'm not going to go into too much detail with respect to that. So I just have a couple of examples here of um, what uh, asthma action plans look, look at. This has actually been very recently updated. This is a pediatric asthma action plan um, that is from the Ontario Lung Association. We actually piloted this at SickKids um, before it came out. And so re remember when I was saying you can, we can use like the stoplight analogy here and we, we talk about what good control means. And so this will be something that you do in, and fill out in conjunction with your healthcare provider. Um, and what we do here is that we input what your controller medication is, what you're going to be taking on a daily basis. And again, everything that I had talked about what good control means is what we're doing in the green zone. Then if um, you can see what it means in the yellow zone here, what it means when you're starting to get out of control. And this is sort of like a little bit of a precaution and what you want to do as step up therapy. And again, this will all be discussed with um, how your um, healthcare team wants you, wants you to respond. And it could be in different ways. But for example, again, viruses are... Um, Viruses are um, one of the uh, triggers, one of the most common triggers for childhood asthma. And so say, for example, you know, you, your child is sick and you're using the rescue puffer and it's been every four hours, but they're stable and it's been about two days. You know, they may say, you know what, you should really go see your healthcare provider at that time and really get reassessed. Because what we can do at that point is that we can prevent you from getting into the red zone and going back to what are our common, what are our primary goals is we want to prevent risk. We want to prevent any future risk. Then you can look at in the red zone. One of the key factors here is again, we want to prevent any kind of serious life-threatening events from occurring. And one of the key things that we talk about here is that if you are using the rescue puffer and it's not lasting you three hours, you know what, at this point you really need to seek um, emergent, urgent medical attention, because again, we don't, we want to prevent anything from um, seriously, um, from any serious life-threatening event from occurring. Okay, and so these are just a couple of other um, different examples. Um, Asthma Canada has uh, their own action plan. It's on their website. It's downloadable. Uh, you can use that one as well. And here's one I know that Chio has from um, from their emergency room department. And please, if you've been to Emerge, 
um, um, because of um, your child's asthma, it's really very important to have a um, short follow-up with a primary care provider um, so that adjustments uh, can be made if it can be made um, if needed. Okay, and then when we have good management, this is what we should expect. No um, asthma episodes, very little need for um, reliever or rescue medicine. They should be, go be able to go to school and have normal physical activity, normal lung function, and normal sleep as well, and to have no side effects from any of the medications. And then also with respect to the continuum of management, um, asthma control is very important. This needs to be reassessed at all times with respect to symptoms, if, they, if there have been any symptoms, um, you know, how is the lung function doing if they're able to do that, the breathing tests, you know, have there been any changes in the environment, have there been any um, new triggers. We also need to ensure that the inhaler technique um, is um, that, you know, we haven't forgotten because um, this happens all the time. Again, to make sure that we're adhering and compliant. And also, you know, another thing that will be regularly assessed is if there's any comorbidities or any other risk factors. There's certain things that are associated with asthma, certain things like food allergy, allergic rhinitis, eczema or atopic dermatitis, you know, other things that are risk factors like obesity and mental health issues. These all need to be um, reassessed as well. Okay, so um, for the last little bit, I'm just going to talk a little bit more about what kind of supports should a child have in daily life. And I just want to speak from a holistic sense here. You know, it's very important to have um, in general, very good health and well-being. And since viruses and colds are the number one trigger um, um, for children with asthma, it's very, very important to be constantly washing your hands. Hand sanitizer is completely fine. That's a, you don't want to spread any infection. Don't send your children sick to school or to daycare because this is going to um, increase the chances of, of spreading infection. And also, we want to get the flu shot uh, for preventative measures. Very important to get adequate sleep. Um, we don't, um, when we're not sleeping, we suppress our immune system. Um, also, it's very important to eat well, eat a very balanced diet, eat uh, fruits and vegetables that are colors of the rainbow, stick to whole foods. We want to be minimizing refined sugars and be well nourished and drink water. This is all very, very important for um, overall general well-being and health and wellness. Exercise, again, very important for lung health and overall health. And just because one has asthma, they should not be avoiding physical activity because they're under good control. It should not be an excuse. Um, and again, getting outside. Recent studies have been indicating there's there's um, a huge importance to getting natural light for health and well-being. So if we can exercise and get outside at the same time, wow, those endorphins would really be um released and, and really affects the, um, you know, it uh, boosts up the immune system. The other thing, minimizing stress levels. You know, stress can be um, a trigger for asthma. You know, the number one mental health issue right now is anxiety. It's, it has suppressed depression, and we're seeing a lot more of this in children. You know, allow your child to have quiet time allow for rest and relaxation other than constantly being on the go, go, go all the time. So this is all very important um, in order to maintain uh, good health and have your asthma under good control. Okay, so the last thing that I'd like to talk about is supports in school. And this can also be supports, again, in daycares, uh, for other daycare, for other um, caregivers as well. Yeah. Um, this is taken from creating asthma-friendly schools. I know Asthma Canada, uh, the Lung Association, and OFIA, they have a collaboration with respect to this. Um, it is very important to have a, a clear process to identify students with asthma. Many schools, they have um, standardized forms that um, need to be in, um, that need to be completed that, invol that invol involves sorry, both the family, um, the healthcare prescriber, um, and also the school. 
it's very important to provide the school with a list of medications and instructions how to take them properly. This is a great time where you can share your asthma action plan with the school. Um, and then again, very, very important to ensure that students with asthma have easy access to their medications. Um, you know, I know in Ontario, we have Ryan's Law. Um, you know, it's it, Ryan's Law that, that, can, that can help with this and um, if the schools can access this information very readily. Um, you know, it's very important that a child with asthma doesn't have their puffers locked up in the office when their classroom is on the other side of the school or they're in a portable. They need to carry with them, carry it with them um, at all times. Um, we need, also need a process. Um, a very clear process for handling worsening asthma and ensuring um, that either if the child is taking their medications themselves or that the people um, that are with them are properly trained as well. Um, we need to be able to have children to be inclusive and to participate in school to the best of their abilities. Um, you know, uh, exclusion is very difficult um, for children um, and especially they can feel different. And they, a lot of times they don't like to take their medications in front of um, other children. And so transparency can be very good to allow for participation in school activities. Um, and then um, also identifying any um, uh, asthma triggers within the schools. I know a lot of the schools have gotten rid of chalkboards, um, you know, so that the dust isn't a trigger. But also, you know, there th that uh, you know how we said that allergens and um, you know pet pets can also uh, pets of other children um, in the schools they can carry the dander and that on on um, their clothes and 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 th this can even affect um, someone who is very sensitive with asthma and so it's just being very mindful of these type of things. Um, and also providing opportunities um, for asthma education for anybody, for um, all the people that will be um, with children um, with asthma. And the last thing is very, very important to collaborate and to communicate with the people um, in the school that in schools and daycares that are with the children. And because we uh, understand that what you know what good control asthma means and how much of the reliever um, or rescue puffer have they needed in school, and to ensure that that gets communicated back to the families, or even vice versa, if you know if your child has been having a bit of a difficult time at home. And, you know, just let, you know, let people know just to, at school and have some sort of form of communication that, that is going back and forth. So the last thing I just want to end off with is that there is the, um, I'm sure many people have heard of um, the upcoming September week, or so, sorry, September peak or week 38. Um, this is the, I know the Asthma Society has some great information on their website with respect to that. Um, it's very important that a child's asthma is managed very well and under good control before going back to school because this is a very, very real thing. Um, and um, trust me, I am running off my feet um, a couple weeks after school has started. We get a lot of admissions for asthma during that time. And so, and I hope that what the information that I've provided for you today will help you, um, you know, get your child ready for school and um, in under good control. And uh, that's it. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Susan, for that uh, amazing presentation. It was very informative and very detailed. Um, I certainly learned some some new bits of information and as well as some great reminders, um, like being honest with your healthcare team about adherence because we don't want to be over medicated. Um, the the fact that the blue inhaler or rescue inhaler doesn't really address the root um, of the problem, and um, and so. It's very, very important to uh, to take the controllers regularly. Um, 
and uh, some some great information there. I just wanted to remind everybody that we do have some great information on our website, asthma.ca, specifically for children, for parents and caregivers. Um, as Susan mentioned, we have a asthma action plan that is downloadable and printable, so you can print it out before your um, visit to your uh, physician um, and your healthcare team. We also have some great resources about asthma management in school and best, best practices, which is also a downloadable booklet, um, and some great information about September peak um, targeted at various different age groups. And all of that can be found and downloaded on our website, www.asthma.ca. Um, now, we do have a number of questions, um, and we can get started on that. Um, let's see, the first question here is, um, at what age can kids be tested for P with PEF? Mm. OK, that's a very good question. Um, so if you want to look at, there's the peak expiratory flow rate, and there's also, there's other um, sort of variables that we look at with lung function as well. Um, usually um, around five to six years of age, here at SickKids, we're sort of specially trained, we can, we can start a little bit younger. But what it is, is basically your child just to, just all they need is to be able to follow instruction and all that. And again, this varies depending on how um, develop, uh, developmentally advanced the child is. And what they need to do is if you take a big breath in and you blow out fast and hard for as long as you can. And with that, then that's essentially what the breathing test is all about. And then if you wanna do peak flow meter at home, um, there's a little device that you can use and um, it's good to have, a, have an asthma diary where you can record it. And on all that is, is just basically being able to blow into, um, blow into a tube. Again, it's taking a big breath in and blowing into the tube. But it's good to do this with um, a healthcare provider just to make sure that it's being done appropriately because there are certain things that we need to look at um, to make sure that there aren't a sort of um, falsely high or low readings as well. All right, thank you. Here is the next question. Um, is the controller medication increased by a certain amount in the yellow zone? So double dose or quadruple dose? Okay, this is a very, this is a very, very good question because historically, yes, this is what we have done um, for, for children. Now I'm talking specifically for children. Um, but the new 2012 guidelines from the Canadian Th Thoracic uh, Society, of which it gathered all the experts, um, experts in childhood asthma, and also for they did an update for preschoolers, we no longer um, double the dose or quadruple the dose of control and medication at the time. Apparently, when they took a look at all the literature, it did not make a difference. So we no longer use that strategy anymore. Okay, that's uh, great to know. Now the next question, are the, the disposable cardboard spacers as effective as the plastic aero chamber spacers? Another, another very good question. What happens, I don't, I'm not sure with respect to the uh, disposable cardboard Spacers. I mean, I know that they've been used sort of in other places in the past. The only thing is um, when you use a chamber, you want to use a chamber that has an anti-static material on it. And what I mean by that is um, it'll say, it should say it on the chamber itself. And what happens is when you spray into it, um, um, a lot of times the medication can adhere to the outside of the chamber. And so you're actually getting less of that. So um, I just highly recommend a chamber that has um, anti-static properties to it. And that's going to give you the best delivery. Okay, thank you. Next question. Is there a timeline to follow for reassessment or is it only when exacerbation occur? No, actually... Um, it is actually better to get reassessed on a regular basis, regardless of uh, an exacerbation. Definitely, if you've had an exacerbation, 
you should be um, reassessed um, afterwards. But um, in terms of our primary goals for prevention, it's better to be reassessed on a regular on a regular basis, even when um, a child is well. So it depends, you know. Um, Sorry, like I, I'll tell you in terms of guidelines here, even for moderate to severe patients when we have, and if they're doing well, um, we'll see them within, sorry, we'll say maybe three to four months time, just so that, And but also you might wanna look at things like, you know, if the viral season is a bad season for your child, you know, then it's always good to have, get reassessed before that starts. Or if you know that the springtime or the summer is a bad season, always get, reassess before that period of time so that you can you can be provided with strategies um, from your healthcare providers um, um, in order to prevent exacerbations. Great, thank you. Uh, the next question is, if it is not possible for a child to avoid asthma triggers at school, for example, they were placed in an old and dusty classroom, what can they do to keep their asthma under control? Okay. Um, so I think ensure, so again, ensuring that they have their rescue, um, puffer available. I think this is, that's, um, a very important keeping track of how many times they're taking their, um, rescue puffer, um, depends on what the trigger is. Um, you know, there might be really simple things that we can, um, do with the school in order to, um, uh, there's certain things we can do with the school in order to um, reduce any, um, reduce the, the triggers. Um, yeah, I think, I think that just keeping track as well, making sure that they're on their controller medication and that, that, it's, that it's the most appropriate um, amount as well. Okay, great, thank you. Um, another question. Why is the back to school period in September so much worse for children's asthma than other months? So the reason why is um, what we what we believe is that during the summer months, um, children are out of school. They have um, certain gotten a lot of them have gotten off track with um, a regular schedule. They're not taking their controller medications as sort of as um, as um, often as they should be. They're probably missing many doses. Um, and then there are many triggers um, that the school environment um, sort of um, has. When you go back to school, um, there's children that are um, they're sharing their viruses back and forth. Um, most children are not washing their hands. Um, also, the other thing, so the viruses, and just because of the exposure um, of so many children, all in sort of small areas, um, that is um, that is a part of it. And also in the fall time, a change of weather can be um, a trigger. Uh, also, there is uh, ragweed and also there's mold. And so it just seems to be this bombardment of so many triggers that affects um, many children that um, it can create this uh, September peak. Okay, great, thank you. Um, I have a question. I often hear from parents that they are nervous or scared um, to uh, give their children inhaled corticosteroids. Um, can you address this concern? Yes. Okay. Very, very good question. Cause we get a lot of this. Okay. So uh, the inhaled uh, corticosteroid, um, what we have to understand is that there are many different steroids within the body uh, that uh, produce different and each steroid produces different things. What we are administering inhaled is not an anabolic steroid. It's not going to increase the muscle mass of the child. It is an inhaled glucocorticosteroid. And its only, its, its sole purpose is to decrease inflammation. And because it's inhaled, it only goes to the lungs and it doesn't produce barely, it, it, the side effects are very, very um, minimal. If we wait until we get to a point where a child needs an oral steroid, this is where the side effects 
really, uh, you know, you get much greater side effects. And it's very, very potent to be getting oral steroids all the time. Because what happens is the oral steroid goes into the stomach, gets into the blood system, and that's how you can get um, side effects. And so, um, and so in this, you know, what you can say, like what we what we tell a lot of our families is that one course of the oral steroid is actually equal to one year of being on an inhaled steroid. This is the potency. And um, what we want to focus on is we want to focus on prevention. And it actually causes more harm to be on a roller coaster ride off the off the inhaled steroids, get the oral steroids, off the inhaled steroids, get the you you cause a, there's much more uh, side effects that um, can occur with that and long term effects from that. There was a study done um, at SickKids where they looked at mild to moderate um, mild to moderate uh, children with asthma and long term for uh, like we're looking at 20 plus years, and they were on inhaled um, and looking at the inhaled steroid doses and the only side effect that they had seen from that was that the child's height was one centimeter uh, uh, one centimeter um, smaller than the controls, but then they played catch up later. Other than that, there were no other significant side effects um, from the inhaled steroids. And so, um, but there are definitely um, side effects that occur with oral steroids. Is that, is that, is that helpful? It, yeah, that's a great, great response. Thank you so much for clarifying. Um, I have one other question, um, something that we've been hearing a lot about recently with all the wildfires um, raging in this country. Um, yeah. Do you have any advice for people dealing with wildfire smoke and uh, children? Oh, that's a good question. I, I'm sure m my uh, colleagues in BC could, could, could answer this question. Uh, um, Again, making sure that you have your reliever medications on hand. I don't, I mean, the only thing that I can think of right now off the top of my head is that um, we, you know, for for children that have sort of cold, um, you know, cold air in, um, induced asthma, it's uh, very important that we, um, that we breathe through our nose uh, as as much as as much as possible because the nose um, it filters it humidifies uh, and it warms the air so uh, you know focusing on breathing through our nose and actually cause and and having coverage um, coverage I mean that um, like a you, you know usually using a scarf or something like that um, and again making sure that you're getting reassessed maybe even more frequently. Um, with these wildfires, um, and then you know sometimes even you know obviously removal. Sometimes the only thing you can do with an environmental trigger is to have removal from um, the the trigger itself. I don't know. Thank that's that's so what much. I can think of at the top of my head right now. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. I know you must not see a lot of that here in Toronto, but um, I thought I would ask anyways. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> um, I think we have one last question. Um, what can be done to help children remember to take their controller medication and why is it so important? Yeah, again, it's very it's very important to take it regularly um, because I because when we're we're targeting the inflammation and the you know the swelling or or the mucus and this can take uh, a bit of time to develop and it also takes a long time, especially with viruses, it can take a long time for that to go away. And because we're using, it's a preventer medication and you're using low dose every single day, this is, this is, and it takes, like we had said, like I had said, it takes a good two weeks in order to get optimized um, from it. And when you're getting viruses all the time, um, this is the importance of being on it, um, on a daily basis. And in terms of remembering, um, we kind of will use strategies 
um, and try and get, um, you know, the children to come up with some ideas of, um, you know, if it's twice daily dosing, like what do you do twice a day every day that that um, you can that that you can maybe put your puffer beside. A lot of times it could be brushing the teeth or, um, you know, a lot of kids love their electronic devices and they have alarms on it. So we say, you know, use the alarms um, on these electronic devices to remind them. Um, and then, or, you know, have it by the, you know, by your kitchen table um, at your place setting or so that you can remind it. So, but we also really try and encourage um, engagement of children themselves to kind of think of, of, of strategies to remember to take their um, medications. The other thing I want to say about um, about um, the inflammation, about the inflammation and the swelling and mucus that is um, building up it, um, over time is that, you know, this can, when you get sort of constant exposure to these type of allergens, it's a little bit, you can think of the analogy, like when you gain weight slowly over time, and it can happen slowly, 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 until one day, all of, all of a sudden, you step on the weight scale, and you think, oh my goodness, I just gained 10 pounds, I just don't know how it happened. It's the same thing that sort of, sort of happens uh, when you have asthma, and you can have, if you have constant bombardment of of certain triggers that cause inflammation, it happens over a long period of time until, and the lung function, and your lung function can slowly, slowly, slowly decline um, until you get to a point where, where you know, you get one more, you get another virus, and then you can end up um, in eMERGE. And this is why where lung function can be um, very useful, especially in like our example, our moderate to severe population. Thank you so much. Those are some great tips. And I really particularly liked your tip about engaging the, the children themselves um, in remembering to take their medication. Um, I remember at our last Asthma Pal session, um, the kids were talking about different ways that they make it more uh, interesting to take their medication and when, when one of our asthma pals kids uh, mentioned that she's put stickers all over her um, her medication to make it a bit more attractive so um, I thought that was a really nice idea um, but thank you so much Susan that was great um, and very very informative some great reminders as we head into back to school season um, and once again I would like to remind everybody to visit our website www.asthma.ca there are some great resources and information available and uh, we invite you to come and take a look and for sure download um, an asthma action plan. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye. <laughs>